Good morning. Welcome to the Martha O'Brien Center and to this neighborhood, Casey Place. Uh, we especially want to thank and welcome our mayor for, to be here today, the Honorable Carl Dean. Um, and we want to also thank the faith community, um, all of the um, pastors that are here today to, to talk about this important issue. It is our true pleasure to formally welcome the Children's Defense Fund to Nashville, an organization that is well known throughout this country and beyond our borders for its courageous advocacy on behalf of all children. We look forward to a deep partnership here between Martha O'Brien Center and the Children's Defense Fund because we work from the same core belief. All children can be successful. Children living in poverty can achieve what any other child can achieve if the community invests in them, protects them, and believes in them. Every child must be our beloved. Our faith requires nothing less. Last spring, early on a school day, Jonathan Johnson was killed waiting for the school bus. Two young people lost their opportunity for a life filled with love and joy that day. We mourn with the family of Jonathan, but we also remember the family whose son took his life. This place, this community knows the pain of a child cut down by violence. We know when a whole community grieves because one young son has taken the life of another young son. We welcome the good work and the strong commitment of the Children's Defense Fund and our faith partners to raise awareness of the violence in our communities that impacts our children and the lives of our young people. Martha O'Brien Center is a creative activist ministry. And when we want to do something new, when we want to make positive change, we start by changing the conversation. No organization does that better than the Children's Defense Fund. And we have a deep respect for that work. And we welcome their leadership so that we can prioritize this conversation about violence in our neighborhoods, our community centers, our schools, and our places of worship. At Martha O'Brien, we are building a college-going culture. Our programs at Stratford and Maplewood, the top floor, and the college zone are debunking the low expectations of some for kids without resources coming out of vulnerable neighborhoods. We can do better than a pipeline to prison. Our young people are graduating and graduating with a plan for a full life. We believe this coming Children's Sabbath, organized by the Children's Defense Fund, is a great start to a new school year. Martin Luther King said, our lives, our lives, begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. This really, really matters. We are grateful to have the strong voice of the Children's Defense Fund engaged in this work and in our city. We are proud to welcome an organization to our city that has deep roots in Tennessee and has never, ever been silent about what matters. We pray for and will work together for a school year free from violence. At this time, I would like to welcome Reverend Janet Wolf of the Children's Defense Fund. Pastor Ringer and other pastors who have come in since we started feel welcome to come on up and join us. Good morning. On behalf of Marion Wright Edelman and the Children's Defense Fund, I want to thank Marcia Edwards and Mayor Dean for their presence and their partnership, for their welcome and their support. We are grateful also for Deputy Chief Johnson and for leaders and community organizers who are providing leadership in this work. We're here today because we are committed to increasing our community's investment in all of Nashville's children. The Children's Defense Fund has recently opened an office in Nashville and created a local organizing team that is listening to students and families, to congregations and teachers, to identify the feeder systems into the cradle to prison pipeline and to work to create alternatives. The Reverend James Lawson, a man Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called the leading strategist of nonviolence in the world, the man John Lewis called the architect of the nonviolent direct action movement has also joined us as a partner working with the Children's Defense Fund and our local organizing team. Nationally, one in three black boys and one in six Latino boys born in 2001 are at risk of imprisonment during their lifetime. Discipline issues that used to be resolved through in-school detention now all too often push young people out of school and into the juvenile justice system. 
And once a young person is pulled into the juvenile justice system, they are 50% more likely to end up inside an adult prison than those without juvenile records. We can and we must do better. Marion Wright Edelman, founder of the 40-year-old National Child Advocacy Organization, the Children's Defense Fund, writes, child poverty and neglect, racial disparities in the systems that serve children and the pipeline to prison are not acts of God. They are political and economic choices that can and must be changed with strong political, corporate, and community leadership. And she concludes, we must call for an investment in all children from birth through their successful transition to adulthood, remembering Frederick Douglass's correct observation that it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. This week, the Children's Defense Fund has released a new report on violence, <clears throat> which details the physical and psychological impact of child and teen gun violence. A child is killed or injured by a gun every 30 minutes in America. Locally, guns and other forms of violence are daily experiences for all too many of our children and youth. We are determined to make this school year different by connecting congregations and communities with students in public schools to prevent violence and create positive alternatives. I'm pleased to introduce Eric Brown, lead organizer with the Children's Defense Fund's Nashville team, who will explain more about the citywide Children's Sabbath events. Good morning. The Children's Sabbath aims to unite religious congregations of all faiths across Nashville in shared concern for children and common commitment to improving their lives and working for justice on their behalf. This is the 22nd year of the Children's Defense Fund's national observance of the, child sab the Children's Sabbath. However, this will be the first ever Nashville city-wide observance of the Children's Sabbath. The national observance usually takes place in the month of October. However, we felt the need to do this national observance in Nashville at the beginning of the school year to set the tone. The theme of the Children's Sabbath, Sabbath is beating swords into plowshares, ending the violence of guns and child property. The 2013 Children's Sabbath focuses on how we can end the gun violence that takes a child's life every three hours and 15 minutes and how we can all equip all families with the tools for economic well-being so that in our rich nation, 16.1 16 million children will no longer suffer the violence of poverty that sentences many to dead end, hopeless lives and premature death. The CDF Nashville team, a coalition of Nashville ministers led by Pastor Brianis Mitchell and Vance Ross, the Community of Cheese Program of Metro Nashville Public Schools, Gideon's Army, Urban League of Middle Tennessee, Vanderbilt University's Black Seminarians, State Representative Harold Love Jr., and to Interdenominational Ministers Fellowship, hope this Children's Sabbath weekend inspires communities to act throughout the school year in Nashville to improve the well-being of children. The Nashville City Obser Citywide Observance of the Children's Sabbath activities includes on Sunday, August 1st, 2013, Faith leaders convene at their local middle and high schools before class starts to be a presence and to encourage youth to commit to investing in education, not violence. Faith leaders will not be leading prayer or, dis or distributing religious material, but offering hands a welcome to students, shaking hands, listening to stories, and standing as partners in support of education. On Friday, August 2nd, 2013, all families, youth, and young adults are invited to the Children's Sabbath Interfaith Prayer Service at Vanderbilt University's Benton Chapel, located at 444 21st Avenue South. Service begins at 8 a.m. On Saturday, August 3rd, 2013, we invite all to the Back to, to School Rally called Love's Healthy Start Festival in Hadley Park, located at 1037 28th Avenue North from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. This festival will have a variety of booths providing health screenings and educational information highlighting children, family issues, and activities for youth. There will be presenters, entertainers, and a backpack giveaway until 2 p.m. In case of rain, this event will move to Tennessee State University's Keene Hall, located at 3500 John A. Merritt Boulevard. On Sunday, August 4th, 2013, 
religious congregations of all faiths across Nashville will have worship and prayer services calling on communities to nurture and protect children against the violence of guns and child poverty. Though some faiths celebrate the Sabbath on Sunday, we understand the Jewish and Muslim communities celebrate on Saturday. Please celebrate the event on any of the days of your worship. Faith leaders and congregations can still sign up to be a part of this historic event by contacting our office and filling out a registration form. For more information, you can contact me, Eric Brown, at ebrown at childrensdefense.org. A key partner in making sure that our communities are safe is obviously our police department. We're very happy today to have Deputy Chief Johnson here to share his thoughts. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. At the onset, I want to express the police department's appreciation to Marsha Edwards and the staff of the Martha O'Brien Center for their commitment to our city's young people and doing everything they can to ensure the children enter the school system with the skills necessary for success. The Children's Defense Fund is promoting a healthy start, a moral start, and a safe start for all of Nashville students as they return to the uh, classrooms on the first day of school one week from today. This morning's event is very important because it emphasizes the community's role in public safety, particularly a safe learning environment in the thousands of classrooms within Nashville. Parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, neighbors, ministers, and police officers all have frontline roles in keeping students focused on their education and away from mischievous and even at-risk behavior. From the police department standpoint, we are ready for the beginning of the 2013 school year. Next Thursday, the 72 police officers assigned to the school system will be on campus greeting students in every public high school and middle school in Nashville, Davidson County. That's more officers within our school system than many cities have throughout the state of Tennessee. But it's also clear evidence of the determination shared by Mayor Dean and Chief Anderson to a safe and meaningful learning environment for the students in Nashville. Our officers assigned to schools are not placed there arbitrarily. Each has applied to be a school resource officer because they want to positively impact the lives of Nashville students. In fact, at noon today, one of our dedicated school resource officers, Dennis Hamm, assigned to Croft Middle School, will be receiving the Theodore Roosevelt Police Award for his continuing service to our department and Croft students, despite having liver disease and having had to undergo a liver transplant. As in nearly everything the police department does, we need the community's support to be our best and to be most effective. The same applies to the school system and our students. With the true and active support of families in the Nashville community, students have the best chance of rising to the top of their class. Thank you again for having me, and thank you to everyone here who is committed to being a positive role model for Nashville's ch children. We are very, very fortunate to have the number one advocate for all children in this city who sees the opportunity, the potential of our children uh, as being our mayor. And so I please welcome the Honorable Carl Dean. Well, thank you, Marsha, for giving me space on the program. And let me begin by saying how proud we are of the work that you and the folks at uh, Martha O'Brien Center do every day to ensure that uh, Nashville's children and families succeed. Uh, Janet and Eric, I know a little bit about the work of Marion Wright Edelman and the Children's Defense Fund, and I can't tell you how much it means to me uh, to have a local chapter right here in our city, so thank you for that. Every morning when parents send their kids to school, they have a right to expect, they have a right to expect that their kids will arrive there safely and that they will return, return home at the end of the day unharmed. Jonathan's death last April was tragic and it was senseless. And after it happened, a student safety conversation got started in our community. People from different pockets of our community were asking, what is the problem? What can we do? How can we deal with this? And those are excellent questions to raise and questions that frankly demand answers. Every day I work to build on the accomplishments of previous Metro mayors to do my part to position Nashville as a world-class city, just like those who came before me. 
and you know what my priorities are now, a very strong education system, safe neighborhoods, and a robust job market. Because if a city gets those things right, then the city is on its way. And I think we're doing pretty good here. Uh, we've got a bustling downtown. We have uh, a new Music City Center. And if you haven't visited yet, I encourage you to do so. We've got pro sports teams. We have a TV show that bears our name. And all of that sounds good, and all of that is good. But there's some stuff that we don't do so good at. And while we've made gains in education, and I'm very happy to see it, we can't brag about it. We can't stick out our chest. We have to realize that less than one in six of Tennessee's high school seniors met all the college-ready benchmarks on the ACT, and when more than one-third of them were not college-ready in any subject area, we know we have a lot of work to do. Not when all of the school districts in the 10-county Middle Tennessee region, ours is the lowest performing in reading, and not when in Tennessee, 92% of the kids who attend the bottom 5% of our schools, this means the percentage of schools who perform the worst, are African American. I mention all of this to drive home the point that education is the key to reducing some of the violence that we are talking about. Most of you know this by now, but before I became mayor, I was a public defender. I represented a lot of kids who were bound over to the adult court system. I spent a lot of time in juvenile court. That means that these kids were charged with serious offenses, armed robberies, murders, those kind of crimes. And they were certainly not the kind of crimes that anyone would expect a child to commit. There were so many that I started to try to get to the root of the problem, and I was looking for a common thread in their lives, and I found a couple. One was, the kids' attitude toward education. They didn't like school, they didn't, go, they didn't do well in school, and a lot of them just didn't go to school. And for the most part, um, my clients were truants or even dropouts, and they didn't care about that situation. The second common thread was that they did not have a relationship with their fathers. Actually, these kids had nobody who would hold them accountable. And I've told this story before, but when I was mayor, I spent some time talking with kids who had dropped out, who had left school. And it was a really interesting conversations that I had with, a, with a, several young people. And two of them stick in my mind because they're sort of polar opposites in the results. One was a kid who um, missed school a lot, uh, started missing school when he was in seventh and eighth grade. Um, and then they sort of accelerated as he got into high school. And then eventually at around the 10th grade, he just stopped going. And his take on it was that, um, you know, he got some threatening letters from the court, he got some letters from the school, and nothing happened. Um, he didn't have the sense that anybody cared. He didn't have the sense that his family cared. And so he quit school, and he ended up working at a pizza place. And he, you know, kids are smart. He knew he made a mistake. He knew he was, you know, he was bright, and he was clearly in a position where he was not going to advance, where he was not going to change his life. And, and there he was, when I was talking to him, working in a pizza place at a point in his life when he should have been setting the foundations for a great, successful life. The other was a young girl who, um, who left school because her mother died. And sad story, she had no real relationship with her father. But her mother dies, and she, as, an as a young adolescent teenager, is, goes through a grieving process. And she becomes depressed, and she's got nobody really to talk to. And so it just becomes easier each morning to stay in bed, not to get up, not to go to school. And it just, once you start that, it kind of builds. And you're gone for more and more days. And then a teacher who she had, who knew her, who talked to her, missed her, went to her home and talked to her and got her back into school, helped her work through her grieving issues, and got her back on the right path. And the message of that story to me is, is that that teacher, who I don't know the teacher's name, and I'd love to say thank you to her, and I'd love to say you did something really important because you saved this girl. But what she did was what we all need to do is communicate that we care. We care that you're safe. 
We care that you're law-abiding. We care that you're nonviolent. And we care that you go to school and that you work in school to build a successful life. And that is what our obligation fundamentally is as a society and as a city. I understand we have uh, several faith leaders who have agreed to go into our schools on the, on the first day and who are here with us today, and I thank you for that. I thank you for that. And I know I speak for uh, the deputy chief and, and Chief Anderson and the entire police department because we know, and as uh, they talked with the Attorney General Holder this week about, the faith community plays a key role in this. Nobody delivers the message that we care better than you do. I can try, but you guys are so much more eloquent than me. <laughs> and you deliver that message with, 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 with the right tone and the right touch. And so I thank you for your, for your help. And we know we have teachers, as the story I just told you, teachers who care. We have families all over the city who care about other families, but we got to keep sending that message. Um, the city can establish policies. We can provide programs like our after school sessions for middle schoolers. We can do a school attendance center, which we do, that helps with reduced truancy, and they work. Yes, they do work. Those are things that are important for our city to fund. They're important for our city to support, but it takes more. It takes someone like the teacher I told you about it takes someone who is willing to hold a student accountable, someone who is willing to show that they care. So thank you. Thank you for being here. And thank you for your involvement in our community. Thank everyone for coming. And uh, please, uh, we ask the faith community to stay. And, um, be interviewed and uh, talk about what uh, we can all do together. So um, we will have some more time for the press, but thank you so much for coming. <laughs>